Well, thank you for being here. Look at that, fantastic. Ah, so, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about Calabra. I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing, and uh, I will talk too fast. Sorry, um, but there's lots of slides to read if you get bored. You know, when the blah 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 blah, you just you know, read something. Um, so yes, uh, our parent company is is pretty cool. I'll tell you about that in a second. And yeah, we came out of Sousa uh, nine, nine years ago. And we have a mission. Many companies write their mission statement after being in business for you know, 20 years and doing things that no one understands why they do. And, uh, but we, we actually believe ours. And uh, it's uh, making open source rock. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that it spreads virally through, uh, you know, to, to uh, like-minded individuals. Uh, so that, that's cool. Um, and that's, that's the goal. What does that mean? That's the goal of our shareholders. That's what we want to do. That's what the company is for. And so it means when you give me a, a euro or a, a, a yen or a rembini or something, uh, we take that money and that's what we do with it. Uh, we, we put it back into uh, making open source rock. We're a pure play open source company. All our code is open. Uh, we do have to make money. Um, otherwise, we can't spend it on open source. Strange, but uh, that's how it is. And we're not for sale. Um, so, so that's quite, quite important. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the parent company. So Calabra has taken a long-term strategic view of enabling open source use in lots of things. So if you look back 10 years, 20 years, uh, you, you would see lots of proprietary real-time operating systems, you know, the wind rivers and, and all these little RTOSs underneath things. And Calabra has played a huge role in replacing huge chunks of the industry with Linux so that you can start at the bottom of your stack and go upwards free software all the way, right? Like, I mean, that's the goal. Many of our clients build proprietary things on top. We try and avoid that. But um, so, so just silly stuff. Your power tools that you buy from Bosch have Linux in them. You know? Isn't that amazing? Um, and, and we're there helping to you know, do, do all sorts of interesting control things. Your medical device, uh, as you wake up from your uh, post-conference hangover, uh, you look, look out of your bed, and the medical device going ping. Uh, next to you is, is potentially running Linux, you know, and, and this is great. And so we do all sorts of things, virtual reality, uh, you know, mobile devices, car things, uh, big semiconductor companies. We work with all of these people um, to enable free software from the ground up, basically. Pretty much ha hardware drivers, graphics enablement, lo loads, of, loads of things like that. And we also have an AI practice, which I particularly like. Um, you can watch the video perhaps later, but... So, so this is standard H.264 sending a video of someone talking. And this is what happens if you send a picture of them, as in this is the guy, and then you do image extraction, feature extraction on their face and see how they're talking. And then you send the features to the other end and then you apply it on top of the image. And it turns out you get a 90% bandwidth reduction. And the quality is as good, if not better. And if you up-res this with a, another clever AI that adds detail and so on, you end up with an amazing picture of this person at the other end uh, with a tenth of the bandwidth, all open source. Of course, it's not a product, it's a demo, but do, do have a look at it. I think it's, uh, it's pretty, some pretty cool stuff out there. So just an example of our machine learning uh, group out there. Oh, and I guess our media group, we do lots of media stuff too. Anyway, but you're probably more interested in the LibreOffice piece, which is my, my part, so half owned by me and half owned by Calabra, a parent company. And uh, we, we focus on, I guess, Office productivity, open source stuff, primarily LibreOffice. And yes, so there we go. And we do all sorts of things. We make various products. I think you probably are familiar with them. Um, so Calabra Online, you know, digital, giving your digital sovereignty back to you, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to return ourselves to that Garden of Eden, you know, where, where we controlled our own technology and people weren't watching us all the time. And I like this tag, you know, your own private office in the cloud, you know. We'll sell you a chair you can put on a cloud and you know, get some peace and uh, look down on other people, uh, very important. Um, so, uh, and, and that, of course, is all built on LibreOffice technology, and you, know, you can get SLAs and so on. I'm not going to tell you about that. I can LibreOffice you'll be very familiar with. It's a uh, you know, branded version of LibreOffice based on that, uh, and it's really the foundation for online. You know, like the vast majority of the code that we put in online is, of course, LibreOffice technology, and we, you know, we love that. that. That's a very unifying way of, of describing all of it. Uh, we release annually, um, and then we maintain that for three years at least. Um, this is not the tip of our spear. 
Calabra office. I think if you're a trustee, you'll have seen why, you'll have seen our, our sales graph, and uh, you'll have seen the impact of the marketing plan that was supposed to you know, accelerate this. Um, it, it's well-meaning, but uh, ultimately, yeah, there's a reason that online is the tip of the spear. And of course, we do consultancy too. So we, we fix things and make things and sell that in flexible ways. And we partner with people. So one of the things we love to do is partner with people. And these are just a few of our partners. We have 200 and 230, something like that. Um, I think it's more than that. Um, and the goal here really is to try and make a way that an individual or a small person can project power and competence and strength into their market that we can work together with these pe people to make your small business into a, a business that can do enterprise level support. And that we can then share revenue on that, we can sell not just training and migration, but also a recurring revenue stream. So what, one of the problems with open source is it's quite easy to sell consultancy <laughs> to some people. And, and uh, you know, in small volumes after they've discovered they have a problem. But, but when you fix that problem, they don't have a problem anymore. And, and so making that a recurring revenue so that you can hire people and predict you know, how you're going to pay them next year and next month is difficult. And, and consultancy has, has been likened to driving a, you know, a car in fog. You, know, you can make the car bigger, um, but you know, pack more people into the bus, but you still don't seem very much further ahead. And it's, it's kind of risky. So what we love to do is try and make recurring revenue so that you have a client base and you grow that base and you can, you know, you get that revenue from people, and, and you provide value to them, and you build a long-term, a long-term relationship. That. So yeah, and uh, obviously it's free and free and open source. It's very easy to uh, do things badly. Anyone can uh, download a Docker image. Many do. Um, we compete with only Office, and it's interesting that you know we talk to hosters, and they're like, yeah, we use the free version, and then we patch it and we remove these files, and we grab their binary Docker image from ages ago, and we tweak this and tweak that so that we can for free, provide something that, and we, you know, we shard it into lots and lots of little things to try and avoid limits, and I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very cuteness going on out there that doesn't fill me with the, you know, the, the competence uh, feeling, but of course it works for many, many users. Um, yeah, and it's, it's cheap to do it badly, and lots of people do that, uh, and it's a shame. So we try and build a brand uh, that means that it's done well, and we try and encourage people to pay for stuff because otherwise we can't pay our staff. That's, that's pretty much how it goes. So we, you know, my job, I guess, in charge of this excellent team is to try and feed them, you know? <laughs> try and help them and enable them and give them the equipment and the tasks to do that, that you know, our customers want or will want. Of course, we do it in lots of languages all around the world. And if you want to, if you want to be involved with that, come and, come and grab me. Uh, there's all sorts of special prices for various different cases and so on. Um, but enough commercial pluggery. Let me talk about uh, features and LibreOffice and things. Um, so to us to mention how good the LibreOffice technology uh, positioning is. I love Italo's cunning, uh, cunning design of this. I think it's a fantastic way of explaining uh, what we do and how we can do it together. Um, and I'm just going to... Um, yeah, I'm just going to say how, pl how pleased we are to contribute. You know, it's, it's really good to be part of the LibreOffice uh, development community and just show you some of the things, some of the things you've done. We, a few examples. I can't summarize the, I don't know how many thousand commits uh, that, that we did in the last year. Um, this is a particularly annoying one. Uh, I, I, who, who has seen this dialogue at the bottom? I mean, I, I, this is the, are you still awake bit? Okay, a few people are. Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, well, well done for being awake. That's good. Um, possibly the most annoying one in the world. And, and we get customers, you know, oh dear. Anyway, this is a very popular bug. And also very difficult to fix. <laughs> it's a really, really nasty. I mean, we could have fixed it very badly and wasted huge amounts of memory and, and brought your machine to its knees. Um, but anyway, thankfully, a good thing came out of the crypto bubble. A bubble? Sorry, market. Uh, so um, there's this wonderful company, Dev, DevX DAO, that is doing decentralized blockchain, something, crypto, everything is good. And uh, through Mohamed Kara's company, which is great, hopefully we'll remember Mohamed, um, he, he, they provided work to, that allowed us to do this, which is, which is fantastic. And of course, to bring it online with some EC money as well. Um, artificial intelligence. People are, say to me, what's your artificial intelligence story? I don't know why they say that, but they, they feel we should have one. And probably we should. I mean, I don't know. It seems like it's a, it's a trendy thing. Um, so here's, what, here's one way we can do uh, bring AI to, to LibreOffice. And uh, that's through uh, grammar checking. So 
some parts of grammar checking are really not susceptible to, to AI. For example, uh, checking your ISBN has got the correct checksum. Like, it is an actual ISBN. It's not very good for AI. Other parts of it, in terms of you know, some of the more complicated sentence structure pieces are. Now, LibreOffice has had uh, language tool support for a long time, but the language tool company makes a beautiful server product that, that sits in the, in the cloud. And actually, it's a really encouraging example of an open source company building an open source product and, and doing well. And so, and I love it. And they're based in Germany, language tooler. Okay, go to Potsdam and see uh, Daniel Naber and what, he, what he's doing. And I guess partly they, they, they ride on Grammarly's adverts. I, I, I constantly see Grammarly adverts. Maybe it's just me. But um, you know, the, the not very good grammar checker with a very large amount of marketing turns out to be, uh, you know, you, you can sell it. And, and it's a little bit annoying to me who struggles. I mean, if you see the prices early, $18 a seat list price for, for Collabora Online, right? They're charging that a month or more for, for just the grammar checker, which is, uh, which is interesting. Um, Anyway, so thanks to Avenis for helping accelerate this, but we now have the, uh, the web um, remote uh, grammar checking API. I think Mert uh, did that, and it will call out to the server and you know, give your text to them. Of course, you can do that on-premise, because we're kind of privacy-focused company. You, know? uh, you don't really want uh, the grammar, all of the text you type to be sent uh, over the internet to someone else. Um, and so that's not on by default. Obviously, you can turn it on with their, with their server, or you can uh, run your own language tool server locally. But yeah, nice to have. Sparklines, another, another feature that our aggressive competition have been pointing out that we don't have. And so, uh, so some great work there. Uh, thanks thanks uh, for, for doing that. And of course, that's back to the, the EC, um, have, have done some, some work under like a business accelerator grant scheme, which has been very, very helpful. Um, to, to do that, so, um, and these are essentially just a little chart in a cell that, that shows you a trend. So, yeah, I mean, like you could do the same by embedding a chart and turning off the axes and stuff. But anyway, we need to be interoperable, and it's not it's not done like that. There, there's a very very simple charting I made there. Uh, this came out of I think the French government wanted this, so I think. Um, there's a DJ FIP uh, organization, and I think they're having problems with their copy and paste. And it turns out that we haven't had the latest image support. We are many years out of date, and wouldn't it be good to, uh, to have it? So anyway, merging that in. So now you can copy and paste between the browser and elsewhere uh, using WebP, and of course, render lots of images uh, in that way. Content controls, I think Torsten mentioned earlier, the, uh, the work we've done there. Miklos has been uh, making a whole load of these, these things work uh, very nicely, uh, which, is, which is kind of cool, um, particularly for uh, governments uh, who are, are riddled with forms. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what government is about, isn't it? Collecting the same information again and again and again. I once went to a hack fest in the National Health Service, and there was a guy there, and he'd been to every doctor's surgery in his, just his county and every hospital, and he collected the form that they used to you know, ingest you. And all of these forms asked the same questions, 50 questions, um, in a different order and a different layout was slightly different. It was qu quite encouraging. Anyway, look, can't have enough forms. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if they're electronic and you could auto-fill them and you know, do, do good things? Anyway, so, so, but this is really helping people make more forms easily, you'll be pleased to know. And, um, uh, but, but anyway, we're exporting them to PDF hopefully nicely now and uh, making this uh, work, work really nicely. And this is something that we can't, the words can't do, as I understand it. Uh, you know, you need to use an Adobe uh, a thingy to do it. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that'll be a nice, unique feature for LibreOffice uh, 7.5. Um, color theming, so another thing that's really irritating is the blue box problem in LibreOffice. Um, <clears throat> you know, every time you click, you get a blue box, right, full of blue, and uh, it's probably not what you wanted. And wouldn't it be nice if it fitted in with other things in the document? Um, so we're slowly moving in the direction of making it less blue. Um, which, which is probably good. Um, chart data table, so another big key interop feature. People have these charts, they put them in their slides. Microsoft has this feature of putting a little data table underneath the chart so you can see uh, what's going on and uh, allowing you to edit that and so on. And Quickie has done some great work here to, uh, to make that work in, in LibreOffice, uh, which, is, which is useful. People complain when the, uh, the chart, the, you know, the, the data is missing. They, yeah, and it's, it's been like that for a long time. A Deeple translation stuff also built in. So Mert, I think, is, I think, I hope he's Mert is the master. Um, but this is essentially a you know a way to to integrate a, a Deeple server. You have to have an API key, annoyingly. Um, so yeah, who knows? But enterprises that have uh, translation needs can put this inside their uh, 
a VPN, and then you know, translate uh, to their heart's content uh, built into Writer. So that's good. Well, why show contributions? Lots and lots of people have contributed many things, and that's good. Uh, and we are only one part of the community, obviously, and many people will be talking about the cool stuff they've done at this conference, and we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing those talks. Uh, but we really want to encourage people to get support and services from companies that contribute back. Maybe not my company, but just a any company that contributes back. That's really key. So please, when you buy a product or a service, you know, ask, you know, what? What have you contributed back upstream? How's that worked? Who have you worked with that contributes back? And you know, it's useful. It's useful to remember that all of those things are done, paid for by customers. You know, like there's no free ride here. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Document Foundation. I have a few thoughts and, and, and trends and asks, and I hear I hear things around the place. So I just want to say this. It shouldn't need saying, but I will say it anyway. Calabra loves LibreOffice, right? Um, I hear that people are trying to destroy TDF. I don't know who they are, but it's not us. Uh, we help TDF in many ways, and you can see later. We're, we're ar arguably the largest code contributor, uh, and we review and we mentor and we encourage people to join LibreOffice, and we help them do it uh, every day. Uh, and we help users too. Um, there are other variants of they contribute too much, um, which, is, which is a good criticism. I like to hear this criticism. This is, this is good. I, I feel very relaxed about that. Um, but then, of course, people worry that they might stop contributing too much, you know, and then, well, that would be bad. Um, but again, there are no plans to stop contributing too much, right? Uh, I mean, like, please don't drive us away, but at least, you know, we, we, we don't want to do that. Um, I hear, amazingly, that Calabra doesn't want in-house developers at TDF. Well, that's not true either, uh, and we do. We just want them to be peers in the community. Uh, we want them to be tasked by the board, as normal, managed by the ED and the team, as normal, and helping to grow the community, you know, as, as, as real members of our community and not, you know, stuck off. And hopefully we can hire these people soon. So, I mean, I, 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 I would just encourage you to beware of polarizing narratives. If you hear something that seems very strange and doesn't fit with what's happening, um, yeah, please, please do uh, you know, challenge that or come and ask, is it really true? Uh, that this is happening and so on. Um, and I think, you know, even after we disagree on details, I think Torsten captured this really well, you know, we have a large overlapping goal of making TDF succeed. And I read these slides last night, so, you know, there's obviously some group think going on somewhere. Um, another thing that I hear is that, um, you know, TDF has to do this. Um, you know, it's really, it's really vital, and TDF absolutely must do this. And it's, it's unfortunately, English doesn't have a good way of saying, this is mandatory versus I passionately feel that you should do this. And so it's completely fair that, to say, you know, for me it's vital that TDF does that, right? But please don't dress this up in some legal language saying it is legally mandatory that TDF does this. TDF has very, very wide freedom. It does not have to pursue all its goals simultaneously or to the same extent. And here's a good example of something that we do uh, relatively little of. Actually, we leave it to the ecosystem. This training of governments and private organizations about the use of the software through seminars and workshops and so on is notionally a goal of TDF. Arguably, it's something that we could fund and resource and advertise using our brand and push out there. But it turns out that one of the ways we really succeed, and Luther's done a great job building, you know, certifying these people, is building an ecosystem of trainers around the project that do a fantastic job. They, they do this already. You know, like, why would TDF want to come and duplicate something that works well and provides, you know, great input to the community and people around the project that do good things? I mean, that, that to me, would be nonsensical, right? So it may be an explicit, written, black and white goal of the foundation, um, but it's something that we can choose to not pursue to the same extent as some other things that we do as a board. I'm not on the board, luckily, so uh, someone else can wrestle with that problem. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, introducing the software to children and adolescents. Um, I mean, Laszlo's done some fantastic work on Ligo, Libra Logo, you know, and, and there are all sorts of things in schools, right? Um, but none of that, as, as I can see, has been done by TDF per se. I think Libra Italia have done some, some good things. Um, and maybe that's something we should look at more of. But again, it's not something that TDF itself is choosing, choosing to do. It's happy to let you know, the whole wider, wider community do these things. So I think that's really good. And I think it's worth, so, so my plea there really is just be, just be careful how you express what you want to, to say and not make it a, 
polarizing black and white. It has to be this versus it has to be that. We have, we have space, I think. Right, so here is, here is how TDF, I think, works. Um, I, I don't know if uh, that's how it really works, but it, it, it's supposed to be there. One of the things I'd like to uh, say is that I think, uh, as our, our manifesto says, you know, we encourage corporate participation by sponsoring individuals to work as equals alongside other contributors in the community. We have a bit of a problem at the moment of uh, trying to other or, or divide or exclude or say these people are not part of our community, they are bad and other and different and they have different goals and, you know, and I think the reality is that everyone has different goals. There are many different goals that people have. Um, in as much as they overlap with TDF's goals uh, and its mission, uh, we should work with them. And even if they don't overlap with TDF's goals, but they're good for things that are TDF's goals, then we should work with them. And I'm I, I, uh, pretty distressed to see people being excluded who have vast experience and goodwill and love for the project uh, from many, many places where it would be better to include them. There would be better decision making and, and better, better results, it seems to me. So I think there are, there are concerns, some serious concerns about that. And that really comes down to balancing interests. There's a lot of talk about interests. So here are a few ideas, and maybe, maybe you can think about this. So, so here's one idea. Perhaps everything should serve TDF's goals that we do here, right? Like the community serves TDF, and they should be directed by TDF, right? Top down, that's one vision, okay? These are extreme ones. I, I called them straw men on my slide before, right? Um, <laughs> but people don't know what straw men are. They're, they're like an unrealistic caricature of an extreme. So that's an extreme view. Here's another extreme view. TDF serves the community, right? Its goal is to do only what the community wants it to do. And you know, like its direction should just be an average of what everybody wants to do in LibreOffice, right? Well, I think that's also not, not really the case, right? So like TDF has a mission, and it should serve its mission, obviously. It, like, so, so, so it has an independent goal, and we've written it down, right? Like you can look at it. Um, but it has also wide flexibility in how it meets that goal, right? So it seems to me that wisely collaborating with other people who have very different goals um, it, it is kind of obviously the right thing to do, right? And all participants had interest. I mean, it's a great tragedy to me that Oracle and Sun left the project. I mean, I think it was one of the, the worst things that we've screwed up early in the project was somehow not winning them over. I mean, it was a difficult ask, but Possibly, were we to do it again? Well, I don't know. Anyway, but, you know, so, so, but say AMD. AMD did a huge amount of work uh, for TDF, um, with TDF and through Collabora, uh, and, and just improved the software hugely. But only for a time, right? And it's ludicrous to think that AMD's goals are going to match TDF's goals. That's a nonsense, isn't it, right? I mean, it's a gigantic, multi-billion company but if we can find areas of cooperation and collaboration where we can leverage the huge resources that others have, then, well, you know, why wouldn't we, you know, why wouldn't we do that? And I'm encouraged, I mean, back in the day, there were some compromises there that were, that were needed to do that, and, and, and TDF did those, you know, made those and, and got a great result. Um, another, another thing I'm thinking about is transparency. So I think uh, in the last board, there were some really big improvements in transparency. I think Lothar uh, helped, helped lead those. Um, and a lot of the board's business was brought out, as it were, into the open. Um, and that's probably a good thing. Like, I mean, you know, like we have commitments to do this and so on in our statutes. But the balance there of what should be open and shouldn't be is, is again, not obvious. It's, it's not like, a, you know, all this or all that. It's some and some. And that required lots of background. If everybody is now going to be involved in this discussion, there are a lot of things that people need to know, right? And that makes Italo's life very hard because, well, and Mike's life, because, you know, in publicly, our public marketing is, is a picture of happiness and unity and fun and beauty and, you know, just this very lovely, coherent thing that is this LibreOffice. But actually, under the hood, as Bismarck says, you know, uh, and he was a pretty successful politician, I believe. Um, you know, laws are like sausages. It's better not to be, see them being made, right? Um, and so I don't think it's really a surprise that we see conflict or, you know, discussion, heated discussion uh, that, that's spreading outside the board that previously was perhaps more isolated to the board. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, this, uh, that, which, is, which is a shame. And possibly we get that balance wrong sometimes. It seems to me that, yeah, like, there's so much information there, there's so much to be said. You can have very long mail threads with, you know, lots of confusing stuff in it, and I don't know what value it adds um, and what leadership, you know, should do there. But anyway, the, the board is at least more transparent, which is, which is probably a good thing. One of the things is that our executive is not really transparent, and I think that's probably reasonable um, in, the, in, the, in the past. Like, so with, with, a, with a board fighting each other in private, wouldn't it be nice to insulate our staff from the consequences of that and seeing it going on? And wouldn't it be good to avoid micromanagement so Florian can get on with his job and, and do it without uh, interference, you know, and, and so on? But I think in today's, in today's board, you know, we have an anachronism there that the staff have private and closed discussions regularly. The board are not allowed to attend. And, yeah, what, what's said is not, not minuted and doesn't escape uh, that group. I've been in a few of the open ones of those where interesting things are said that are not, like, con controversial, but just useful and technical, technical discussion that I think should happen in the open. Um, and then there's the private staff list, which is possibly, you know, one of the most closed lists we have at TDF um, that has no board presence and oversight. Uh, and that seems to me unhelpful in terms of getting the staff and the board to work together um, smoothly and seamlessly. So, not my decision, but I'd uh, encourage you to think of that. And I think this is my last slide of, of sort of interesting things. Um, meritocracy, I hear often uh, meritocracy is uh, the membership criteria, right? You know, it's fulfilled by ensuring that to be a member you have to have done something, you know, and contributed meaningfully. Um, but every nonprofit has some kind of membership criteria. To me, that doesn't seem to fulfill the goal of listening to people in a way that reflects the value and the experience and what they bring to the project. And I, I see people with vast experience in so, some areas uh, being <laughs> ignored or told they don't know what they're talking about. And it, it just seems to me that this is something that at least as developers we take quite, it comes quite easily. Like it, it's, it's fair enough to have some newbie arrive with a patch, that's brilliant, and we encourage that. Um, but if they start arguing with someone who is extremely experienced in that area and has written the code and maintained it and gets all of the, the problems, that does just seem very silly. I mean, like, you know, it's a great way to look silly uh, if, if, you want to, if you want to do that. And I think we need to retain and regain perhaps that understanding that it's basic common sense to, to weigh heavily, not take the gospel, obviously you can be experienced and wrong, but to weigh heavily, uh, you know, the advice and input of those who actually know a lot about uh, one area. And I think the ESC perhaps does this quite well, and it's one of the most peaceful places. And, and I think it's focused on just doing it, and, and, and perhaps realizes that people don't have to be there. I mean, like the, the ESC is really not a command and control thing. It's like a grouping of people who meet to try and discuss you know, how we can work together to resolve any conflicts, to say what we're doing, um, but not to tell people what to do, per se. We try and gently embarrass people who have regressions into fixing them, but, you know, yeah. Be useful and fun. So that's my TDF things. Let me talk just a little bit about uh, Collabor Online uh, and some of the last year's improvements. So one of the things was that we, we spent quite a lot of time trying to get the LibreOffice technology branding into uh, Collabor Online, into Nextcloud Office, which arrived in, in the last year, and uh, into our, our partners' uh, Office Suites too. Um, I'm thrilled to see Nextcloud Office on the TDF infrastructure, but for a long time we didn't have the right logo in there. So it's, it's really annoying, because uh, Gilham has a brilliant cross-site scripting avoidance something, and so it wouldn't download it from our server. But now, now it does it remotely and all is well. So, uh, so we have the right branding there. And it's really important to us that when you click on that, you, 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 find, you find out about LibreOffice and you learn about LibreOffice technology. We keep this. We don't put it in our software. We put it on our website so it can be taken down immediately because we're, you know, like... And my hope is that the legal team will sort out the trademark situation in a beautiful way soon. Everything will be clear and crisp, and, and they'll stick with that for a while. So, so, but either way, we, we, we try and credit people, and we even have pictures. You may find yourself there. Uh, so, so hopefully, you know, when your smiling faces are showing up on the, on the team photo later, uh, we'll show up. Because we want to be saying, we want to be talking about LibreOffice. We want to be saying how good it is uh, to, to be involved with LibreOffice, obviously. 
Um, and hey, there's a whole load of features we've done. So there's JavaScript sidebar, we've, we've improved things. Uh, precise anchoring, better user experience on mobile, accessibility checkers uh, coming to online, various dialogues and properties, uh, improved performance in various ways. Uh, bandwidth reduction, so now Collabor Online streams tiles and deltas to them, so it's a bit like, I guess, a keyframe, and then changes to it, uh, which can save lots of bandwidth and CPU time. Uh, more CPU time savings coming. I'm trying to get my patch uh, fixed. Loads of polish on the user experience. So this is, it, it's hard to understate how important user experience is, and I'm sure Heike will tell us this later. Um, but, it, but, it, but it's easy to think, ah, oh, that feature is what's important. But actually having a polished UI has an amazingly pleasant effect, you know? And, and I think as we think about improving LibreOffice as a product, I think user experience is one thing where we could significantly invest. I think we have a, have a gap uh, there that, that we could happily fill um, in a totally non-controversial way and, uh, and make, it, you know, make it a product that people not only fills a gap, not only does lots of things in a powerful way, but just feels sexy, to use a random sexualized word. Um, lots, of, lots of commits then, uh, stress testing, Prometheus metric, lots of things, more than I can possibly put on a slide. A whole load of non-collaborants, uh, helping there in the last year, and thank you to everyone who's uh, on that list. Um, we have a, if you're interested in coming to Berlin after this LibreOffice conference, we're going to be doing some, some fun stuff there, uh, alongside the next cloud conference this year. Um, so nine years, what have we done? Well, we're still contributing significantly to LibreOffice. Um, actually, a smaller proportion of the commits, and let me tell you, commits are not everything. You know, there are people as well, and people are probably, you know, I'm Torsten's got, a, got the right focus. People are, people are key, um, but it, it's obviously nice if they, you know, get lots of commits too. But, um, so this is a smaller proportion. Collabora is shrinking as a proportion there. And I have this always on, on the side of my slides every year. We need to improve our ecosystem diversity-wise, um, and let's make sure that people can build successful businesses around it. Uh, and that, that's the, really the best way to do it. And we serve in lots of ways. This is, uh, this is, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I don't know. You, you may not think that two board members is, is, is easy to, you know, to, to dedicate, but some of these people come out of those meetings totally demotivated, you know? <laughs> it's not just the meeting time of an hour, it's like the day to recover, you know, and, uh, and try and get, get back into uh, some sensible state. Um, and of course, mentoring and, and Summer of Code and all, all of these things, we do lots of things uh, to help uh, TDF and, and tell people about LibreOffice. And of course, it's all done by the team. Um, and those people in black, somehow, somehow they get to the top of the list, commit list, and also manage a team. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. I, uh, I, I'm, well, I'm well impressed anyway. It's, it's not easy. It, you know, it seems easy to hire lots of developers and then all your problems are fixed, but actually you have to manage and motivate and task and inspire and help and, you know, uh, encourage them uh, to, to do good things as well. And that's, that's not easy. And so we're hiring. So if you want to join the team, talk to me. Work from anywhere role to do any of these things. We'd love to have you on board. And here's a picture of some of us. I'm nearly there, I think. Oh, I, in fact, was there. Cool. So, so in conclusion. Collabora loves LibreOffice. I think that's a key message that we have. Yeah, and, and we see LibreOffice and making it better as actually an application of our mission, uh, which is to make you know, free and open source software rock. Um, we want to liberate people's documents. Um, our goals are not the same as TDFs, but they overlap hugely. It's all paid for by our customers and our partners, and we can't do anything without a customer or partner or someone to pay the bill. And you may look at Collabora and think, oh, what fun, they can do anything they like. Um, we get to do exactly what our customers tell us to do and our partners. That's it. Uh, and alongside our staff, branding is really one of our only assets. So we really appreciate you telling people about Collabora. It's a pleasure to be able to sponsor the conference. Thank you so much for being here. And come and talk to me later or my team. It would be fantastic. Thank you.